So this presentation, I'm going to address the biosecurity concerns that were highlighted from a single site outbreak of APP as part of a larger regional outbreak that occurred across multiple production systems from November through January of 22. Um, so just a little bit more about, about me. I, I don't know many of you in this room, so just to tell you more about my background, I'm a 2016 graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, prior to that, I was actually a high school science teacher. Um, so you'll get a little bit about that today. Um, graphics, I'll try to keep people engaged. So you're gonna see a lot of pictures. Um, I was employed by Tyson Foods, the pork group, uh, two weeks after I graduated veterinary school, went down to Oklahoma, started in Holdenville, uh, very proud to start there. And now I've been the manager of veterinarian services for Tri Oak Foods for the past four years. So proud to be the head vet at Tri Oak and certainly have seen a lot of challenges and I got into a lot of finishing barns with my experience there. Um, and then like was mentioned, I was the 22 awardee of AASV's Young Swine Veterinarian and I'm very proud of that award and I really appreciate that recognition from my peers. Um, I put this picture in here because you will find me out in the barns two to four days a week, minimum, some days, five days a week. I'm in the barn. I'm a practitioner, so I get to see this firsthand and see our opportunities. I wish I could get out to more barns because our sites, I mean, we have over 400 different finishing sites, and I just can't get around to every one of them um, in a year's time. So I rely a lot on our production staff, and you'll see that here in the presentation. Um, a little bit more about Tri Oak Foods. What is Tri Oak Foods? You might not be familiar with our company. We're based out of Oakville, Iowa. We have over 400 employees and we have over 350 contract growers. So I have about 800 people that are seeking advice on biosecurity at any given time. We're located between the Iowa and Mississippi rivers. Um, but to go beyond that, uh, we are 17th in the successful farming magazine uh, for 2021. We've continued to grow into 2022. So we're gonna probably bump up a little bit on the rankings uh, into 22. Um, we have approximately 74,000 sows uh, and owned sow units across five different states. So we are in uh, Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Ohio. So a large expanse, many different regions, a lot of different challenges there. And then our finishing sites, we actually just crossed 1 million market spaces this year. Um, we are based in Iowa and Western Illinois. So you can see all of our sites there. Like I said, over 400 sites. Um, they're both owned and contract and we produce almost 2 million market hogs. So that gives you a background, maybe some trust here about my experience and what our company is about. So you can see like the breadth of it. So just talking about more about the outbreak, uh, we'll start with just like, what is APP? So like I said, I was a teacher. I'm not gonna assume knowledge. So like, what is APP? Actinobacillus pleuronemonia. It's a highly contagious gram negative bacteria that causes severe pneumonia in pigs. It's characterized by sudden onset, high mortality, high morbidity. There's at least 18 different serotypes. There's probably more out there. One, three, five, and seven are the most common and are considered to be endemic in the United States. Uh, APP, the mode of transmission is direct contact by nasal secretions. Fomites, like contaminated boots, clothing, equipment, can spread the organism. It only lasts for a short time on surfaces. So I think that's important to note as we go through this outbreak investigation. Uh, it spreads aerosol, but very short distances. From what I've read, half a mile or less. Um, when I was working for Tyson, we used to put APP positive pigs right next to APP negative pigs at a transfer station and send them out and they would stay clean. So they were on the same site only a few hundred feet apart and they did not get contaminated by aerosol. So I feel aerosol is extremely low for why we got this uh, outbreak. Um, other stressors can facilitate transmission or precipitate outbreaks like overstocking, transport, loading out market hogs, inadequate ventilation. Just a really brief summary on APP, like what is it? Um, maybe you all read this um, from Pork Business, but it, it did get highlighted. There was an APP outbreak in central Iowa, why? Um, so there were a couple articles that were put out in February about it, APP strikes with a vengeance and other upper Midwest South, or pig farms. It's a bizarre situation. We were part of that. Um, so the background on this outbreak, just to go over it, um, from November 25th, um, through January 24th, there were 20 cases with the primary diagnosis of APP that were submitted to Iowa State's diagnostic lab. All of these cases were from growing pig sites, either weaned to market or finishing, and the cases were spread across nine different production systems. The commonality here was they were all APP serotype 15, which is very unique. Um, it's not endemic in the U.S. sow herd, um, so we were wondering where did it come from? It seemed to be lateral. Why was it spreading? So we did some investigation. There was a Schick and AASV webinar in early February. I know some of these individuals are in the room. This is all public information. So you have the nine production systems um, highlighted here in the dots. And I would say APP is the commonality. How did all these different sites get infected with APP? 
So Do Dr. Ian Levis from Seaboard and Dr. Pete Thomas from Iowa Select both were on that call, um, so that they had eight and seven sites respectively. Um, they were late finishing, they weren't from APP positive sow sources, so it seemed to be a true lateral infection. So this is kind of what I think it looks like more than the previous slide. It's not like one single source of APP infected all these nine sites. It was probably indirect. Other sites infecting other sites, some commonality between the sites. Um, the outbreaks were spread over the course of eight weeks. It's likely not from the same site or source, but likely connections between these sites in finishing. So some biosecurity risks. I show this to our people very often, and I tell them the blue is things that they cannot control generally, and what is in orange is things that we can control on the farm. So when we look at this outbreak, we didn't have any incoming hogs at any of the 20 sites that we became infected. They were all closed, ready to market. So no incoming pigs. We certainly didn't infect them by new, new stock. Feed, there was no commonality between feed source. We came out of different mills. So we eliminated feed off the list. And then we can talk about aerosol exposure. So Dr. Mike put up a picture there of like the reality of the business and where we are located. Here's our site circled in red, a little site and a lot of pigs around it. So we're in a very hog dense central Iowa location close to Ames. We had one site that was infected in our whole system. The ability for APP to move by air is limited to a very short distance, like I mentioned, 0.8 kilometers, half a mile. Aerosol risk and spread of APP, it's possible, but I think it's very unlikely in this situation given the density of pigs in the neighborhood and other pigs that did not become infected. Why would it skip over 10 sites and hit a site further away? There was some other commonality here. And it was a pretty limited number of cases, only 20 cases in eight weeks. Feels pretty tight knit. So, I eliminated the possibilities of external risks from our investigation and I said it has to be one of these other things that was in our realm of control. So one biosecurity risk that we did review was dead removal. So of the 20 growing pig sites, 18 of them used the same rendering company out of the same location. So ours was included in those 20, uh, or it was 18. The common rendering service that was used was Darling International out of Belmont, Iowa. So I stole this picture off the internet, but you know, it'd be pretty typical shows up with the rendering truck, what's this guy doing, no booties, common gloves, normal what we would see. Um, here's the photo of the sites would be pictured in yellow that were part of that outbreak. And the red square around it would be the reload um, station area. So the reload station would pick up carcasses from everywhere in that red square. But yet only those sites were infected. I wonder why did it not get out towards Storm Lake? Why did it not get up to Humboldt, right? Why was it so clustered in such a small area? To me, it seems like we have a much fishier link. Maybe it walks on two legs. So, another, so many other sites um, in this territory use the same rendering service as I mentioned. Um, it's a source of introduction. It's certainly a possibility. I think it's a maybe. I think it would have been much more widespread if it was rendering. It would have infected more sites. We probably would have had multiple, multiple sites break, but that's my opinion. So for our single site outbreak, and what I can speak to is this. So we have our Colorado multiplication flow that filled this site. So very high health pigs. At the time, MERS negative, mycoplasma negative, influenza negative, APP negative, a totally clean source of pigs, really nice pigs coming out of our, our multiplication unit, multiplication barrows. The site is producing pigs on a two-week batch as two separate sites of farrowing. So we're doing it on a two-week batch. So you'll see that on the fill. We placed them on 7.8 and 7.22. We placed almost 3,000 head in those two fills. Unfortunately, we had uh, some issues with projections. You guys may might be familiar with that, but sow projections were off. So we sent an extra almost 500 pigs to that site that we needed to pull out as overstocks uh, at the beginning of October. So that was the only other contact or movement to the site other than market loads at the end. So here's the clinical presentation. So like I said, I'm a practitioner. I'm in the barns every day. I have to telemedicine a lot. This site is three hours away from our corporate location. Um, that, that's where I was at this day. So put, put, put yourself in my shoes. Monday, January 10th, you get a phone call from this guy, Rick Morgan, great fieldman. He had just started with our company. Um, sudden dead, high mortality event, actively marketing finishing hogs. We already pulled out first, first cuts still pigs in the barn, sudden death overnight. 
175 dead pigs, otherwise good, healthy looking hogs, no other problems. Like I said, they came from a high health source. Extreme lethargy was seen in the population, dead hogs present in multiple pens across the site. And to me, now I'm thinking, okay, we just came in and took out market loads, the select cuts. We went and contacted every one of those pens. So what contacted each of those pens within our barn? So what was the source of contamination? Live pigs that were still left in the barn were dogs sitting that had a deep hacking cough. So I asked Rick to get in the barn and get me a video because I need to know more. So we'll see if this works. I'm hopeful and optimistic. Um, so you'll, you'll see blue marks on these pigs. Those are the selects that were gonna be pulled out um, the next day. Um, you'll see a lot of pigs down to me. It looks a lot like a ventilation failure um, when you first look at it, except for the deep hacking cough. So I'm hopeful that the, the audio will play. that are dead, the scientists are some of their bellies, hear the deep hacking cough. If you haven't seen an APP outbreak, this would be very classical for it. Good healthy pigs dead, deep hacking cough, dog sitting, cyanosis. So the next step, what I asked Rick to do, thanks for getting me the video in the barn. I think I have a suspicion here, but let's get some necropsy done. So like I said, the intense cyanosis on the underbellies of the pigs, very classical for APP, dog sitting, deep hack and cough. I really want to rule out African swine fever though. It's always on my mind, I'm freaked out. And I think it's just a matter of time, unfortunately, but sudden extreme death loss and cyanosis or hemorrhagic lesions in pigs, we need to be thinking APP, or thinking ASF. So for postmortem, I'm just gonna play this video. Rick's gonna be cutting open that pig. He sent me the postmortem video, but um, here are the lesions. So you can see a lot of pictures of lungs. And of course, we got the picture of the spleen down here to rule out ASF. So the spleen looks normal. Okay, let's look at the lungs now. Um, so, you know, big, consolidated lesions of hemorrhage. Um, you can see the focal points within the lung and the demarcation of healthy and abnormal tissue um, seem to occur overnight. Fibrin attachments to the body wall. And as he cuts open this lung and pulls down the ribs, you'll be able to see that. But I would say these are very classical lesions for APP. And we were able to make a presumptive diagnosis just based off of the videos that he sent. So never discount the importance of telemedicine in our business especially as we are so consolidated and get larger and larger, send videos, bring your phone in the barn, let's figure this out because we're gonna have to diagnose some big, bad, ugly things over time. So you can see the fiber in there on the lungs, uh, very classical for APP. He sent me this video, like I said, pretty much diagnosed it right away. Wanted to get treatment initiated. So there's many ways to cut into a pig too. So just go get the lungs. So he pulls them out. You'll see those hemorrhagic lesions um, and how firm that is. It's a really classic picture. So I wanted to make sure I shared that with you if you haven't seen it before, so that'll stick in your mind. So like I said, um, the lung lobes are covered in fibrin. They're diffusely consolidated, necrotic. These are some pictures from K-State. So we made that presumptive diagnosis. We initiated treatment to minimize those further losses while the samples went to the diagnostic lab. We had them drive the samples to the diagnostic lab that day. It's just in Ames, we drove them right over. We had an answer that week, um, but wanted to get treatment initiated. So I'm just gonna go over the histopath. I know this is like not really what this is about, more about biosecurity, but I'm a practitioner. I think it's important there's people in the room that might be interested. So really what we're looking on histopath, hemorrhage, fibrin, degenerate leukocytes, rod-shaped bacteria were present, severe fibrinoseparative pneumonia, pleuritis, microscopic lung lesions to have edema and neutrophilic infiltration of the bronchii. So you can see that in there. Be very classic. These are just the key words that we're looking for on histopath. The bacteriology report came back. The culture was confirmatory that we did have APP diagnosed. Both pigs submitted had a high growth. And the culture um, also was able to 
lead us up to doing antimicrobial susceptibility. Uh, we did treating that lot uh, preemptively before getting these diagnostics back with you know, RTUEZ to manage the withdrawal times. And also it's a very efficacious drug for APP in general. So we immediately had in initiated that treatment, but found that it was susceptible to. So that made us feel better that we were using the right drug. Uh, they did do some molecular diagnostics beyond that to further classify the APP. We were able to say, yeah, it's APP, but what serotype is it? So they did an R&D PCR after the fact, and this was done for investigative purposes as part of this outbreak investigation across the 20 sites. So that was positive, showed us serotype 15. I had never run that test before, so it's a possibility. So that was the diagnostics. So here's, here I'm going to go over the mortality on the site. So this would be typical of the pigs that we would place into this hog dense area. These were MLV vaccinated at weaning. Um, we did diagnose a wild type PERS break um, in late August. So the pigs were placed in early July. As others had mentioned, it's hard to keep PERS out of your barns. Really hog dense area, it can't rule out the aerosol issue. So we did have a 2% bump on mortality due to PERS. But you know, I do believe vaccine will mitigate um, death loss and reduce lesions. So we saw some benefit there. We removed overstocks in uh, early October. So those were our two events. Pretty status quo though, just chugging along. Respectable for this flow and where we put them at. So now I'm gonna show you the next slide where we'll show where the APP break came in and it's severe, it's extreme. It makes PERS look like nothing. I just, <sighs> extreme. There's our PERS break, there's our overstock movement. We were just chugging along. APP came in. And here we'll see in the blue would be the percent of the, morta the mortality percent for the total lot. And the orange is the percent mortality for the pigs that were remaining in the barn. So we'd already pulled out some pigs for marketing. So we lost 33% of the pigs that were left in the barn. And then you'd say probably another 9% because of other losses. So it, and it's just a really extreme mortality event. Really tight, came and went but devastating for our business and preventable, right? It's driven by fomites. We can prevent this from walking into our barn. It's unacceptable to have this happen because if you can get APP, you're going to get ASF and you're going to get PED. So Daryl Holkamp from Iowa State uh, did help us out and do, did a uh, investigation. So the rapid response program APP outbreak investigation was done. Uh, myself, the regional manager that you saw there, Rick, and the field staff personnel, Brooke, were all a part of this. We looked at uh, two weeks prior to the date of the first clinical signs and investigated what are the possible risk factors there. So this is what we looked at, investigated, in the investigation review uh, swine movements, vehicles and deliveries, people movements, and manure removal. All the things that can hit our farm. We're very grateful for Daryl for starting this conversation with us. On April 19th, Iowa State met with all the impacted production company representatives to review the findings. So that was all the nine production companies that were a part of this APP break. So some learnings and considerations for us with this break and what, what do we get out of it? We lost a lot, but what did we learn? So here's the cost of disease. I'm not gonna give you like what I believe the cost is because you can take this to your production metrics, what you're paying for feed today, and you can see what, what uh, awful numbers we had as a result of our APP outbreak. It took us 207 day, seven days to completely close out the lot. 183 days average on feed. Uh, average weight gain was 272 live weight. And we have an average daily gain on the live weight 1.48. Feed conversion, 4.19 live. Took us 6.22 pounds per head per day. And total pounds per head was 731 pounds. So cost of disease, you can extrapolate that and put in your numbers, but it was extremely costly to our business. How many did we total lose in the lot? We had 834 deads out of those nearly 3,000 head that were placed. So 34% death loss in the barn. Um, we had culls and condemns and some no values higher than anticipated because of the residual APP effects. So it's extremely costly. It's devastating. And the producer in this case is a contract producer and his performance isn't linked to mortality, right? So the company extremely suffered. So some site-specific biosecurity gaps we dug in. How did we get this break? It was pretty clear to us that we had some gaps. So there were no syringes present on the site to mass inject the pigs with XNL. It's pretty disappointing. Where, where are your syringes at? What have you guys been doing? <laughs> the syringes and other equipment was being moved site to site. So this producer would care for other sites as well. 
Um, so he was just moving to site to site, saving money for himself, I suppose, but costing our business extremely. So sound the alarm. <laughs> We didn't know this, right? Our field staff are out there all the time. We're just probably not asking the right questions. So this is pretty obvious. We shouldn't be moving contaminated uh, equipment site to site. And this is our personal equipment that should be used every day. The site was actively marketing at the time of the APP break. And this is truly where we think we caught the disease. Um, it was a contracted loading crew. Many others have mentioned today the contracted loading crews. It's a, it's a necessity at this point in the business because of labor issues. Um, but it's huge risk. Our site did not have any shower. It has a uh, rudimentary bench. Um, we assumed that they were changing into dedicated barn clothing, but nobody was there to check on them prior to loadouts. They're just going there by themselves. Um, we know that the, the loading crew did bring dirty equipment to the site, sort panels, prods. They brought their own equipment to the site because we didn't have site-specific equipment ready for them. Dr. Mike mentioned that too. We need to have the sites prepared with the equipment so that they walk in and they have everything they need so that they don't have to run back out to the car, don't have to bring dirty equipment to the site. But I firmly believe that this dirty equipment was used at another site that was infected and brought to our site directly. And that's how we got into the pigs. Multiple pens were infected. That equipment is going into multiple pens. That's how we had it so widespread right away. It's my belief. So the cost of dedicated site-specific equipment is negligible. 40 bucks for a sort panel, come on. Producer was required to dispose of all the dead hogs after the event requiring on-site burial in January. It was like in excess of $15,000 for the producer to bury those hogs. So it hurt them there too. We forced them to do that. You know, you weren't mitigating biosecurity on your site. So again, trial, we suffered significant economic losses as a result. So it's cheap, right? And our business would be modeled, the producers and buying all their site-specific equipment. Trioc wouldn't be buying that for them. But maybe this is where we need to start thinking of our contracts and what's, best, what's in the best interest of our pigs. We probably need a shower at our sites too. So closing site-specific biosecurity gaps. Um, like I said, that disease introduction was in multiple pens at once. It's consistent with contaminated equipment entering the multiple pens to pull out those select hogs. We did have a discussion with the loading crew supervisor and revealed that he did have a shared connection of labor between production companies, its familial re relations. So we use a guy named Victor. His brother is Miguel. Miguel sees Iowa select pigs. Bruno sees Prestige pigs. They're all traveling in the same car in the morning and then dispersing to their sites. So we're all in this contaminated vehicle and then dispersing to the sites. It was a hard conversation with Victor and I'm not gonna say that we helped stop this outbreak, but we had a very tough conversation with him because he is doing lots of loadout of our pigs and the APP breaks really stopped after this. They stopped in February. I don't know if we were the last break, but it was a tough conversation. We just basically said, this is it. We can connect the dots, stop it. We're gonna get you the equipment you need and we need to do better. But goodness, we are relying on people that are executing out in the field every day by themselves, right? We have to have some trust and give them the training they need, give them the tools and supplies they need to get the job done. Daily caretakers, vaccination crews, loading crews, they all pose a significant risk. I'm, I'm taking care of little pigs today. I'm loading market hogs for another system in the afternoon. Maybe I got to go back and vaccinate another group of pigs later that evening. That's what's happening and that's the reality of it. So we need to put barriers in place to prevent the disease from walking into the barn. So I say this a lot in our company, focus on what you can control and don't get caught up and brought down by those aspects that are not in your realm of control or influence. Everyday risk associated with biosecurity must be mitigated to have effective barriers in place to stop this disease. So entry procedures into the farm, shower, clothing, boots, seems obvious. We all know it's basic, right? The stuff is basic, preventing disease from walking in. Dedicated equipment on site. It is unacceptable to bring con con equipment from site to site. We should just have dedicated equipment. These are finishing barns. What do we really need to take care of the pigs? You need to get them off the trailer. You need to vaccinate them. You need to treat them. You need to load them, send them to market. It's not that much equipment. It's not like a sow farm. And then the dead removal procedure. That's also been mentioned today, but it's very critical, right? Loadout processes, make it easy have the equipment that they need there, talk to them, make sure they're aware of your biosecurity processes, have the training in place. 
I did feel that we were able to successfully biocontain this disease within our system. We have many other sites in close vicinity within a five mile radius, and we didn't move it. So I was very proud of our team, right? We reacted very quickly. We had early recognition of the disease. We communicated it well. We took some action steps to prevent it from moving anywhere else. We were really afraid we were gonna lose another 30% of our pigs at another site. We had the interview and discussion with the loadout crew supervisor on biosecurity practices and our suspicions on the point of entry. And I really do think that that resonated with him. I don't know, the APP stopped all of a sudden. I really feel there's some common link here between those 20 sites if all of a sudden it stops after eight weeks. Where'd it go? Market trailers at this site were required to be cleaned and disinfected after hauling the remaining hogs from the site. So that wouldn't be a traditional thing. I mean, we would be seasonally washing some trailers. We just don't have the infrastructure to get it done 100%, especially up north. Um, but we did make the effort there to make sure everything was cleaned and disinfected, recognizing the disease was there. So that's the importance of communication with vet services, market. So important, the basic biosecurity, we need to prioritize those. Um, obvious and basic biosecurity gaps. This was easy, it was contaminated equipment. It's huge, terrible for welfare of the pigs that we just didn't give them the equipment they needed. I think we need to address the elephant in the room. From that Schick webinar in February, I was disappointed to hear from other production companies that we are not willing to address that black elephant. Like, we're, I don't wanna talk about the loadout crews. I don't know how to control that. No, we need to recognize it, we need to grasp that, and we need to do better. We know people know what to say. They always are very much saying the correct thing. Yeah, I know how to load out the pigs. I know the protocol and procedure. Yeah, I wear my booties here and I take my clothes off here and put my boots on here. But what are they doing when we're not looking? How do we get them invested into the mortality of our pigs? And how do we implement those barriers that will just prevent the disease from walking in? Stage loadouts, showers, forcing them into the, into the barn through a biosecure entry, UV chambers. We just need to do better. So further considerations, we need to be more collaborative, I think. I'm not, I don't have any solutions here, but how do we become more collaborative as an industry? This outbreak brought the nine production systems together for a short period of time. Um, we collaborated, yeah, there's, there's some crossover and gap that we have, but how do we do that on an ongoing basis? You saw the picture of our sites. I mean, there's three different production companies within a half a mile of our site. I do not communicate with those veterinarians, and that's a huge opportunity. How do, we, how do we do that in the US? Understanding the connections between on-farm labors and information sharing, same vein. How do, we, how do we understand this and do better? And then influencing change in the United States swine industry regarding the growing pig biosecurity. We're not where we need to be. If you're getting PED into your barns, you're gonna get ASF into that barn. That's my ultimate fear for this business. I wanna be in this industry for a very long time, but ASF could certainly derail that. And I see a lot of sites getting shut down really quickly if we don't close some of these biosecurity gaps. I preach this all the time, but it's just getting through those contracts, right? We have some existing contracts today that aren't going to expire for five to 10 years. They don't have a shower on the site today. It's not in the contract. I have to wait 10 years to get a shower? Holy cow, we have a huge issue in the Caribbean, right? That could come any day. So I just wanna thank you guys. Um, thank Maria Peters for the invitation and thank you to um, the uh, planning committee for the invitation to have me here today. I'm very happy to share all this information with you. If you have any questions or would like to speak to me further, you have my email address. You can also find me in the directory of AASV. And yeah, thank you very much for your time today and listening to my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. You have questions already? Yeah, just a quick question. You talk about the loading crews. Could you give us a sense for how many, to how many sites the loading crews go in a day? And maybe you or Mike or others could comment on that. I'm trying to get a sense for how many, mm -hmm. and obviously will be differences, but do you have a sense whether it's two or 10? And is the movement of equipment, like the sorting boards, is that part of what they bring with them um, per contract? Is no. Okay. It, it wouldn't be part of their contract. The expectation would be for them to use the site-specific equipment, but I think they might just be more comfortable with theirs, not maybe anticipating that we won't have the stuff they need to get the job done. And I don't know that I can answer exactly how many sites they would get to in a day. I would say closer to the 10 number than one or two. 
like I said, some of these loadout crews, I think that they're also taking care of pigs, young pigs, vaccinating pigs, loading out pigs. But Dr. Mike, you can answer. Yeah. Great presentation, Lauren. Thanks. Um, I echo your concerns about uh, ASF getting into the industry. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is, um, this goes back to people, people, people again, right? And part of this, it sounds like from your, your perspective, is very much this contracting. Uh, people who are contracted and providing services because of the labor issues, right? What are the questions that a company um, or a, you know, it, those, the person who's contracting, what are the questions that should be being asked or being agreed to up front so some of these things don't mm. happen? Um, and, and I guess I'm just kind of curious because it sounds like that conversation happened after the outbreak and it solved the problem. But if that could happen before the outbreak, right? Maybe there is no outbreak, I guess. So, so what are those questions, regardless of whether they're doing vaccines or they're doing loadout or whatever that might be, what are those core things that you've experienced, I guess, so far? So there would be a lot of questions that I would have for them. Um, but the biggest issue I see with even addressing those questions with the individual is that us as a company, we're not the ones hiring these loadout crews or contracted labor. It's the owner. It's the producer on the site. Um, and I just don't think they're having those conversations. So you just have a person show up to the site. That's the caretaker. This is his name. Um, we have our field staff try to do some training out in the field. Um, we started a video library. So that's like the next step and hopefully getting people to go through trainings that are very simple and basic. I'm um, trying to get people all on the same page. Um, but it's hard for me to say what questions would I ask? I mean, I would have a laundry list of questions. Do you understand our biosecurity measures? Um, can you articulate that to me? Um, what other sites do you see in today? What other, what other companies are you seeing? I think that's number one. I, I don't think you're going to solve this until we solve that communication gap. Nope. Yep. I just had uh, one quick question. You said that the um, contract grower was servicing multiple sites and had equipment that he was sharing between those sites. Were those all your sites or did he uh, go across companies? Go across companies. It was across companies? It was across companies, unfortunately. But his other site didn't break, right? So I was like, okay, that probably rules out the <laughs> syringe. <laughs> good for him. Maybe that's how we got the wild type of purrs though, right? So. Maybe. Okay. A tremendous well, opportunity on the finishing side. I guess that's just the conclusion of this. Definitely. So um, I think we're ready to move on. Um, thank you once again.